Uh, so, yeah, uh, let's start this uh, workshop. First of all, thank you to everyone who is, who is attending and thanks to SaltPay and especially to Pabayo for uh, presenting this workshop. Uh, my name is Ricardo Couto. I'm the community manager of one of the community managers of World Data League. I am responsible for uh, mentors and jury. So I was responsible for communicating with them and for um, yeah, and for making the bridge between the World Data League and, and the mentors and jury. And basically, I'm, I'm going to be your host for this workshop, and I hope that you will enjoy it. So uh, this, the content for this workshop, uh, we think will be important for you for the finals, uh, as uh, this, this topic will be essential, uh, let's say, for you to arrive to your solutions. And uh, uh, in that case, uh, we have here another participant. And because of that, uh, we will not only have this workshop where you can interact directly with Pavalho and the other SaltPay members uh, we'll, who are very uh, on top of this topic. Uh, we will also share this video uh, in, our, in our channels and, and, we, and you will be able to uh, review it again. Um, Feel free to ask any questions that you want during the session, and Pavallo uh, and the and the other members of SaltPay yeah. will will answer them uh, in the end of the presentation. Um, and yeah, uh, I will now introduce our uh, amazing speaker Pavallo. Uh, besides being an expert for this edition of uh, World Data League, uh, is a machine learning engineer who is working at SaltPay, as I've already mentioned. Uh, he has a background in mathematical statistics and business studies, uh, started off as a data scientist and eventually he transitioned into machine learning engineering uh, after countless painstaking times trying to put models into production. So um, uh, Pavalho loves nature, uh, the ocean and believes octopuses are secretly aliens. Maybe you can talk about this a little bit later. From, for now, I will give the stage to Pavalho for him to present his, uh, this workshop, which is titled Spatiotemporal Analysis and Introduction. Pavalho. Awesome. Thanks, Ricardo. Okay, first things first, let's see if I can share the right screen out of all the millions of tabs that I have open. Can, is everyone, can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. yes. Awesome. So yeah, uh, really nice. Thank you for the kind introduction, Ricardo. Uh, it's really nice to meet everyone. Uh, yeah, so my name is Pavi. So everyone can just call me Pavi. I'm on the MLE team at SaltPay. And I'm joined by a bunch of really awesome and talented colleagues that I have with me. Uh, so hopefully we get a, you get a chat and interact with the rest of them um, in the Q&A. But just to shout them out, I'm joined by Tiger. He's our head of data science. Uh, Pedro, a fellow machine learning engineer. Uh, Gabby's here. She's a, she's a data scientist and a bunch of other peeps. I see Angus is here and some other guys. So yeah, really nice to meet everyone. And yeah, let's get started. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about uh, spatial temporal um, analysis and we're just gonna, it's going to be a very high level introduction and yeah we're just going to talk about what the data is and kind of what the options that you have when you're trying to play and model such data cool let's get started cool so what is spatial temporal data and um it kind of it's pretty self-explanatory right there are two aspects to the data the one aspect speaks about how data is distributed over space, right? However you want to model what it means to be distributed over space. And the other one has to be, the data has to evolve through time, right? So if we fixed our spatial coordinates, however we're gonna use it, um, there's still the evolution of how a single coordinate changes through time. And um, yeah, this is a really cool example of, you know, it could be something as simple as internet connections or calls throughout a country, but it just shows how um, data can be distributed throughout space and through time. Cool. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly obvious that spatial temporal data can be everywhere. Um, but I think what's really interesting is that the examples that we always think of when we think of spatial temporal data 
have to do with almost physics like things, right? So we think of just in general physics, like how do you uh, uh, model the projection of a like a projectile through the air? Uh, but that's not the only type of spatial temporal data that we get, right? So if you think of your IoT device, if you think of a, a service like Uber or Deliveroo, right, they have to be modeling where you are, but they also need to be modeling where you're going to be. So think of um, a model like an ETA service that tries to predict what time your Uber is going to get there, or think of like a service of the actual Uber app of how do I find out where my merchant, where my customers are. Um, but it's not only that. Uh, so some other kind of exotic, really cool use cases of spatial temporal data is like a mesh grid. Um, you want to model what the human body is in three dimensions, and you want to also model how the human body moves in three dimensions. So you need something like a mesh grid, which is a classical example of spatial temporal data. And another one that a lot of people don't realize, which, which is spatial temporal data is video, right? We could think of video as a sequence of images running through time. Cool. So yeah, what would be a typical use case of where you'd want to use spatial data, spatial temporal data? Um, so I, I, I hope everyone agrees climate change is real. But so imagine that um, you have a network of climate sensors and they're distributed over space. So they could be in different countries or they could be you know, in different locations within the same country. And what you'd like to do is that you'd just like to forecast a temperature for the next day. Or in general, you want to forecast a temperature um, at time t plus k given the temperature at time t, right? So what are our options that we have? What can we do? Well, one thing that we can do is that we can collect data at each sensor. So imagine my sensors, I, you choose 10 randomly sampled countries throughout Earth. Each country has a sensor. I could just build a time series model with the data that I have for one sensor, right? For one country or for one province or region within a country. I could just build um, a time series model based off that, um, that one sensor. And I would have 10 different models, right? So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is kind of the underlying hypothesis or thesis that there are correlations between the different sensors, right? Um, so you're actually losing something by not taking into account other sensors um, information. And that's what we mean when we're saying we're not taking advantage of the surrounding space or our sensor data. So the kind of underlying thesis behind spatial temporal data is that there are correlations both spatially the spatial correlations, but there are also temporal correlations, and there might be spatial temporal correlations as well. Cool. <clears throat> so what would be a better way of modeling our data? So suppose that we had these 10 sensors and uh, we wanted to make a, an as accurate forecast as we did for, um, our, for the next day's temperature. Um, well, we could use um, data or the time series from nearby models to help us influenced what the predictions for our individual um, processes should be. And by doing that, what we've done is that we've leveraged both the time data because we had the underlying time series, but now we also leverage spatial data because we're using multiple sensors to make predictions about one particular case. Cool. So now that we kind of have a, um, a sense, and the guys, please stop me if you have any kind of like questions, like if there are kind of chunky questions, like meaty ones, we can lead them to the Q and A. But if there's a word that I explained that you, like you haven't heard before, or if there's like a quick thing that I can, you know, make clear quickly, please feel free to ask. Brad. Um, so what kinds of uh, data representations do we have, right? So like, just because we say spatial temporal data doesn't necessarily mean that we're referring to the same type of data. So how, what are the different manifestations, the different representations that we have with spatial temporal data? Well, I like to think of it as you can fix space, right? So you can fix the region of space that you're looking at and look at how that space evolves through time. So that's called time white data. And you can imagine a pandas data frame or you know a Spark data frame or whatever data frame that you're using. 
or structured data that you're using where the columns refer to different points in time and every row re refers to a fixed point in space, right? So that's time-wide data. You also get space-wide data, which is where you fix T and you let X and Y, or in, in general, so X and Y is meant to be two-dimensional space, but in general, you let your spatial dimensions vary, right? So over here, um, let me check this. Uh, okay, cool. Um, so with space-wise data, uh, what we're doing is that we're allowing, we're looking at a specific fixed point in time. So we don't like time vary, but we want to see how things vary over the space. We can let, we can, re, we, can re, we can release all restrictions. So we can be like, well, we want things to be variable both in spatial dimension and in time dimension, right? And so um, this is, this would kind of, is your kind of classical vector representation but we can also represent them as graphs, right? Um, and so we'll talk about what it means to represent um, special temporal data as graphs, and we'll talk about the kind of ingredients that you need to do that. Um, so over, over to my right, let me see, yeah, I, I don't know my left to my right, so I always have to double check. Um, we have kind of two classical representations of data. So the first one is grid-like. So you could imagine the point in the middle is your 10th climate sensor and you're trying to use the nine points around it to influence the prediction of the 10th red one um, and that works really well when your data is regularly spaced you know you have regular intervals um, but that's not the only type of data that we have right so if you think about traffic data and what you want and the let's say for example the nodes between the edges between nodes represent something like traffic flow um, not not just distance, then it might make more sense to use a more flexible data structure like a graph. And so this is just to show that there are different types of ways to represent the same type of data. Cool. Yeah. So suppose that like you wanted to forecast the traffic volume for a particular place in Porto City. And this is basically just the same example as we had before. The one approach that we could have is to build independent time series models per point, but we're not taking advantage of the surrounding data, right? And the intuition that we have is that there are knock-on effects, or another way of saying that, that there are correlations between two spatially separated points, right? We suspect, so you guys aren't allowed to laugh at me because I'm still learning Portuguese, and I asked my work colleagues how to pronounce these words, and they didn't reply. So I, I vendia de boa vista. So that's the one. That's let's let's call the space. Let's call this x x of a, right? A subsurface a is the first place, and rua Julio Denise. Let's call that x of b. And actually, we should make the second one x of a and the first one x of b. And we want to know how the traffic in x of a affects the traffic in x of b, right? We all know that traffic flows out, right? So it's very likely that if you know that there's gonna be traffic in one point at time T, it's very likely that traffic is gonna flow on and create traffic at time T plus K or at place X plus K, which is another place, right? So the better approach to do is to use, so the better approach rather than modeling the, the traffic at each individual point is to use the traffic data from both places and to kind of model the whole entire network. Right, and that way we're leveraging both temporal data and spatial data. So it's basically the same example as the climate change example. I mean, as the temperature forecasting example. Cool. So, um, how how can we describe um, data as graphs? Right. Um, so what we do is that we choose the nodes in our graphs and we choose the edges in our graphs. And let's discuss what both are, right? So the nodes and the edges of the graphs are super flexible. They can be really anything you want. They don't have to represent distance and they don't have to represent X, Y coordinates, right? For example, the nodes in your graphs, if you're a company like SaltPay that cares a lot about our merchants, the nodes could be the merchants and the edges between them can be relationships between the merchants, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be a distance, 
But even if it is a distance, it can be a modified distance, right? So for example, we might not want to use the Euclidean distance, which is the straight line between two merchants in the graph. We might want to use our own distance metric, right? So the idea is that um, you have nodes in the graph that represent kind of, that represent entities. And then you have edges between the graphs that represent relationships between those entities. And uh, yeah, that's a graph, nodes and edges. Um, but what's cool is that every graph could be indexed by time, right? And so what you have over here is that you have an example of spatial data that varies throughout time, right? So you could imagine we first had three merchants at SolPay and we had some distance metric that defined how the distance between each of them is related. It doesn't have to be the straight line distance, can be whatever we want. And then at time T, we acquire a new merchant and now those merchants can interact. And then maybe there's a new road that's built from the top merchant to the bottom merchant. And so now there's a new edge that's added. Um, so this is to say graphs can evolve in both edges and in nodes throughout time. Cool. So how would we go about embedding spatial data into a graph? Right. So this is just like a very elementary definition. So we have a graph and a graph is a tuple of two things, our vertexes and our edges, right? Um, and a vertex is where two edges intersect. So it's like a node and the edges are obviously the things that like connect two nodes or two vertices, right? And so what you can imagine is that at each intersection or every node, there is some value that we care about, right? So for example, let's say um, we're trying to calculate the average revenue or the expected revenue that we're going to get in a specific city or region, right? Um, the nodes of this would be that, would be the, would be the actual revenue that we got. And then the edges between the nodes could be relationships that we care about, right? So distance between the nodes or whatever relationship we care about. Um, spatial, to, spatial temporal data, it would definitely have to be something spatial. So the edges would have to be something spatial. But what's good about this is that it allows us to, you know, encode prior geographical knowledge instead of kind of just embedding um, our nodes into like an arbitrary position. And um, what's really, really cool about this, which is also seen as kind of like a cost saving in terms of some algorithms, is that you don't have to have a mesh that models every point in your, in your, in your space, right? So imagine that like your merchants uh, are concentrated in a certain part of town. So they're either all in the north of the town or in the east of the town. If you were using something like a grid, um, a grid representation of your data, even if parts of your grid, parts of your, I'm just gonna call it a matrix from now on, if part of your matrix had a lot of zeros because people went there or no revenue is being made there, you would still have to put those elements into the graph, right? So it's a lot of wasted data. Whereas if you represent it as a graph, it kind of acts as like this regularizer because a bunch of spatial parameters, for example, the spatial parameters of the places where you still have to model it, but there are no merchants there, you can just throw them away. Cool. Yeah. So we can, yeah, so as I say, there are many, many different ways to model time varying data. We can model them as static graphs. We can model them as topology varying graphs or the kind of classical physics interpretation. We could just model them as points in an n-dimensional vector space or complex vector space, whatever we want, right? So <clears throat> let's first think about static graphs, right? And a classic example is like the pixels of an image, right? So what you see here is that it's static because um, the vector function varies across time, but the graph topology stays the same. What is the graph topology? Well, the graph topology is basically, without trying to be too complicated, how is the graph connected in a way where you can't tear or cut any two connections, right? So I'm sure you guys have all heard of the fact that a 
mug is the same thing as a donut to its apologist. That's basically saying that a mug and a donut have the same topology, which is to say you can squeeze a mug, you know, you can take all the fat of a donut and put it in the body and like leave the handle there. But unless you actually make a cut or tear it anywhere, they have the same underlying structure. And so when we talk about a graph topology, when we say a graph has a static, when we say we have a static graph, what we're saying is that the little nodes, right? So the kind of, let's say, if we're thinking about revenue per merchant, the revenue per merchant can change over time, but you're not going to change, like the merchants are there to stay. You can't, we're not landlords that can evict them and stuff. We can't tear or change the topology, right? What we can also do is that we can create as many edges between any two nodes that we like, right? So this is kind of showing a locally connected graph. I think it's called locally connected, but it's where every node is connected to the kind of nearest nodes to it, right? Um, but yeah, it's just basically the idea that the topology doesn't change, right? Here's another example of a graph where the topology doesn't change. It's still a static graph. It doesn't look like a graph, like, you know, things aren't nicely kind of spaced out through time, but you could imagine from time t to time t plus one, you know, your electric power grids stay the same. They never change. Some power grids might produce more energy than others. And so the kind of outputs or the outputs of the nodes are varying throughout time, but the topology of the graph is given by the connections or edges throughout the nodes do not change. Right, and then we can start getting wild and we can choose violence and <laughs> change, change the topology of the graph, right? So over here, um, what would this be a classical example of? Well, let's say you're sole pay and you know you just started off and you started off with three merchants and you know how your three merchants are connected, right? Maybe you know the time it takes to travel via public transport from one merchant to another. And that's what you define as an edge between two nodes. And then you know, when you're doing really well and then you get another merchant. So now you have to four merchants and now you have to travel between all of them. And then Musica da Casa makes a new train station. And so now there's a shorter trip. And so now um, you can travel from one merchant to another merchant without having to do a round loop. So this just shows how we can also evolve the topology of the graph and that's just a topology varying graph. And then the last thing that we can do is we can just represent things as points and Rn, nothing fancy over here. We don't necessarily need graphs. All we need is a tuple of n plus one numbers that represent our spatial coordinates plus one time coordinate or plus however many time coordinates you want. Cool, right? And so there are different algorithms that we can use for both approaches, right? So when we talk about dense modeling, what we're really talking about is more structured data. So you could think of as data at regular intervals. For example, um, the initial example that I gave um, with the pixels where everything is kind of like, you know, at regular spaces. And then for that, we can use classical machine learning models, right? And um, by classical, they're not that classical. Um, but they, but they, they kind of, they, they have to assume a fixed structure, right? So, um, they, they, they kind of, they, you have to include the redundancy as part of the, the model input. Then we also have graph modeling, um, where we can treat um, our data structures that go into our machine learning algorithms as graphs themselves. And so, for example, local graphs only take the nearest nodes into account. If I go two steps back, uh, let me see, how do I go back? Do I even computer? Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, this would be uh, so the the image to my right. That would be an example of a algorithm that passes messages locally, right? So I think in terms of matrices, so if we look at the matrix position A naught naught, right? And we had a graph algorithm that passed messages only locally, it would be able to pass messages to 
A01, A11, and A10. Does that does that make sense? Is everyone happy with that? I don't know if I right, cool. Okay. And then we can once again choose violence and have global models that take the whole network structure into account. And it's really cool and use spectral graph neural networks and spectral graph theorem. And yeah, it's, it's really cool. Anyway, so what we thought we'd do is that we would have two case studies of um, how you could use spatial temporal data for a kind of classical um, problem in machine learning. And so the problem that we chose is merchant churn. And the reason why we chose that is like, you know, at Salt, you know, we care a lot about um, making our customers happy. Um, and so churn is super important to us, but also it's kind of like a classical classification problem, right? Like they either churn or they don't. This was a binary classification problem. And so it's really interesting to see how we can use um, spatial temporal data to attack you know, just classical problems that we have in machine learning. Cool. So what's the first approach that we have, right? And this is, and we're gonna show you two approaches, but there are many, many, many approaches, right? And, and so this is just to kind of um, show you what's out there, what's possible, um, but it's not necessarily to say A, that this is the best approach and definitely not saying this is the only approach. There are many, many ways this can happen. So now that I put a disclaimer, um, so um, we already kind of are familiar with looking at a map, right? And so a map is a 2D surface with X, Y coordinates. You know, if you using something like, um, I think it's G's, GIS or ArcGIS, you know, you have your, um, your, your, your GPS coordinates, your latitude and longitude. Um, and you can really think of that as like a flat surface, right? There's one sheet of paper or um, one kind of flat surface, right? With X and Y coordinates in 2D, right? The key idea is that we can incorporate time by taking snapshots indexed by time, right? So, going from one spatial configuration at time t to another spatial configuration at time t plus one is equivalent to taking two snapshots at time t and another snapshot at time t plus one, right? And that's what a video is, right? A video is basically a bunch of pictures that are being sent to you really, really fast, right? And so we want to take inspiration from that and see how we can use this to try prediction. Right, so let's kind of go through the initial setup and make sure that we're all happy with it. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm gonna keep belaboring the point, but so over here, the three things happening, right? They're the indices that we have to represent a specific location. So you need three numbers. So this picture over here is defined by three numbers, right? Well, at least three numbers. If it was black and white, it would be three numbers. The first number, well, the first two numbers are just telling you your X and Y coordinates, right? It's telling you, where are you in this image? Where should you look, right? The third number, F of X, Y, tells you what specific value am I looking at the spatial region, right? So for example, in the cell that's covered in black, the cell X and Y, let's see if I can count on the fly, one, two, three, Five. five and one down. So it's X and Y would be four. Uh, put my head. Would be one, four, right? So if we start indexing from zero, there'll be zeroth index, one index, and then we went five. So it's four across, right? And that's X of Y. That's X and Y. F of X and Y, right, would represent. Um, the RGB values for this image. So whatever RGB values make this image green, um, that would be f of x, y. Cool. So what can we do with this approach, right? Well, one thing that we can do is that we can label our images beforehand, right? Or we can label our spatial representations beforehand. 
So it's stated that there are certain things that you care about in an image and a, a classical kind of image recognition um, task is, um, I think this is called landmark detection or it's something detection. Um, I'm not really sure. But the idea is that there are certain um, crucial landmarks that you care about in an image. And what you can do is that you can label those, those points in an image as your ground truths, right? So imagine you have a, in the same way where you have a regression, you have a Y value, which is, um, you know, some real number, or if you have a classification, you have zero or one, which is some int zero or one. Um, what you have here, so the ground truth value would be an image that has specific points labeled out. And those are the values that you're gonna be trying to predict, right? And yeah, so this is just to say that this gives us a lot of flexibility around how we can represent spatial data here. Cool. Now, why is that cool? Well, we can sort of do really cool things. So imagine the blue square or the blue block is a, a mode. And everyone's familiar with what mode is, right? I don't have to explain mode. Or like, let's say it's the average operator. Right. Let's say the blue square is the average operator. And what it does is that it looks at the red square. It takes a region of the red square and it calculates what is the average, whatever value for that red square. And so you can imagine that's why we have blue there and red there and it brings out purple. Right. Um, so what's cool about this? Right. Say, for example, I know that it like what happens to a merchant really matters for the merchants that are in a local area. This is a really cool representation to have, right? Because if I have this average operator, whenever I shine my average operator over a certain region, I'm able to calculate the average outcome for that region. And I can do it for different regions, right? So I could take this blue square and I could shift it one point to the left or to, to the right. And then I would have a new average operator for a shifted area. Or I could shift it three blocks down, and then I would have an average operator operating on a different square. So now that we know how to model, um, and so just to go back to this, and I think it's a really helpful way of thinking about this is that, so uh, yeah, let's go through. So imagine you have your three by three square over here, right? And then you took that three by three square and you unwound it, right? What would that make? That would make a one by nine vector, right? So you just took your three by three operator and you stretch it out and it's flat, right? Imagine you did the same thing with your average operator now, right? And you lined it out, right? Then what you could say is that every cell in the average operator is one over nine, right? Because that's how you get the average. How many things do you have? And then you divide them by, so you take each value and you divide it by number of things that you have. But that blue operator could also be a linear model, right? That blue operator could be some like linear regression that you train. And so the blue operator could be the beta coefficients for your, um, for your regression value, right? Um, and so I'm just, this is just to say that that blue operator can be a lot of things. Um, it can be the max operator, it can be um, a, a mode operator, choose the most um, often occurring things, it can be a lot of things. Cool. So now, now that we've kind of spoken about how to incorporate, um, uh, incorporate uh, space, space into um, this, let's talk about how to incorporate time and kind of we've already discussed it, right? We've said that an image is just um, a snapshot of spatial structure copied out through time, right? And so um, if you have, for example, we have a bunch of merchants and we know um, what the kind of um, transactions is, let's say on a, um, spatial temporal on a spatial level, right? Then the red square would be 
the spatial financial data for January 1. The green square would be the spatial data for January 2. And the red and the blue square, the blue square would be spatial, temp, spatial data for January 3, right? So what we've done is that we've taken tabular data, right? Which is just, you know, an Excel file that has um, maybe two columns, like the merchant ID or merchant representation and some value that we care about, like, you know, um, revenue for the day. And we've managed to turn that into an image, right? So they're, they're completely equivalent views, right? But for our specific version, we wanted to predict churn, right? So let's let's say that um and so this is an extremely extremely um, um simplified version. So we're assuming that there's one merchant per per pixel of the image, right? Um. So what we would have is that um we would have our uh, so we now we're talking about what our x and our y variables are. Our X variables would be this kind of financial data that has been reshaped as an image, right? And so it represents the time series, um, let's say per merchant for three days, right? In general, it would be for T days, right? And then um, that's that's the data structure that's gonna go into the algorithm, right? Um, how are we gonna, the algorithm is gonna spit something out and we need some ground truth to compare what happened in real life versus what the model predicted. That's also an image, right? It's now just a height by width by one image, right? Um, so the height and the width have to match up so that the spatial dynamics of the image match up. But the one is just basically saying every value is zero or one based off whether or not the merchant, merchant AIJ, um, churn it or not churn, right? So what we've done is that we've taken financial data, we've reshaped it as an image, and now we've also um, managed to um, shape our churn, not churn, so binary classification problem as an image as well. Cool. So let's talk about segmentation. Right. So what you can see over here is that you have two images. The first image is like an image of this, I don't know, like cars, like a, like a mall or something, I don't know. But what you have in the second image is actually two images superimposed on the first on each other. The first image is the original image and the other image is what we would call a probability mask, right? So let's say, um, it, we let's say, for example, how many colors are here? Let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five. Let's say for good measure, there are eight numbers, right? Every pixel in the image would have an associate number one to eight. If it goes into that image, then we color it with an associated color. So maybe all the pixels that are um, labeled zero get the color red all the images that are labeled one get the color blue. And so what you can see is that um, we're able to have an image that gets spat out of um, our machine learning algorithm. And it's, it's spatially, it's exactly the same as our original image. Um, and it's just kind of predicting, it's, it's semantic segmentation. It's like, what is the thing that I'm covering at this pixel right over here? But the kind of general idea is that you have some image, it goes through some black box, and then you have pixel-wise prediction of something, and the output of that is a segmentation result. Cool, yeah. So that's the kind of key idea over here, and it's that um, each picture, each pixel has inherent spatial structure, right? But we don't necessarily have to think of a pixel as a pixel of an image, right? A pixel can be anything we want it to be. It can be a churn probability, it can be a demand forecast. Um, yeah, it can be whatever we want it to be. It can even be a data structure, right? It doesn't even have to be a single number. Um, it can be whatever we want it to be. Cool. So, um, so far, so good. Is everyone 
with me so far? Oh, yeah. So what I want to do now is that I want to talk about one specific model that we can use to spit out segmentations, right? This is to say, I'm going to speak about an algorithm that eats images and spits out pixel-wise predictions on what the mask should be, right? There are many, many algorithms that do this. Um, so this is by far not the only one. This is just one of them. And I'll just, I just want to talk, describe the algorithm and then talk about how it would be used for the specific problem. So I want to talk about convnets. And actually, we've, we've spoken about convolutional neural networks already. And I spoke about them when I said that you could um, take that blue square. So I spoke about it over here. Yeah. Taking the blue square and having an operator, right? Before we had we knew what the well-defined operator was, we said that the blue square is either the average operator or it's the max operator, or it's the linear regression operator. The difference with convolutional neural networks is that you're allowed, well, you, we do two things. So the first thing is that we have three, no, we have two operators over here. So the, 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 the term that they use in neural networks is filters, right? Um, and so we have a W0 filter and we have a W1 filter. That's the first difference that we have. So each of these filters gets learned from data. So you can imagine that each of these red squares is its own logistic regression, you could say, right? And it's going to update its beta parameters, um, um, trying to learn what the uh, optimal parameters are for each spatial location. So what happens over here, so for example, over here, if I'm looking at W1, this is a set of parameters that gets learned by the model. And this is a set of spatial features that um, a dot product is performed over, right? The other thing to notice is that secretly we've incorporated time into here, right? So where does the time come from? Well, if you notice, let's say I let's say uh, t equal three, so I had three time steps. If you notice, I my x data, so the input volume, there's the first layer, the second layer, and the third layer. Right? And they all represent time, right? So what we're actually really saying is that we have three, lo three logistic regressions or three um, set of parameters, right? We have the parameters for the first day. This is the first layer of our filters, right? So this is indexed by that last digit over there. Then we have our second set of parameters for the next day. Then we have our third set of parameters for the third day. Right, so each of these would represent a snapshot in time. So if if you were looking row wise at the input volume, the input volume would represent the first input volume would represent the first day, the second row would represent the second day, and the third one would represent the third day. Right, and what we're doing is that we're using a set of fixed parameters um, to kind of learn which best parameter should be used for sets of three-day intervals. Cool, right? But basically what convnets are is a way to eat image-like data, well, to say arrays. So they eat n-dimensional arrays and they spit out whatever you want, right? So over here, they eat um, uh, a picture of a cat, they go through an algorithm, and they would spit out uh, a list of probabilities saying how likely th that this is a dog versus a cat, right? But we might not necessarily want a list of numbers representing how likely this is a dog or a cat. We can do whatever we want to this Y variable. So we're gonna be a little bit creative. We're gonna keep the input the same. So our algorithm is still going to ingest um, images, images, and dimensional arrays, which represent whatever we want it to represent. And it's going to spit out another data structure, right? And so um, the kind of general, this was state of the art, I, I think until like three years ago, until transformers came and started messing everything up, but they were called fully convolutional models, right? 
And the idea with a convolution with a fully convolutional model, right, is that the algorithm eats images, it eats n dimensional arrays, it goes through what is called the downsizing arm or downsizing arc, right? And basically, a really good way to think about it is how do I take this image and compress the, Im the information of the image into a smaller array, right? So you could imagine the input size is um, 720 by 720 by three. So the height is 720, the width is 720, and the depth is three. If we're looking at transactions data, let's say we're trying to predict whether or not someone has churned based off the last two weeks of transactions data, our height and our width would be whatever the, the, the mesh of our grid is. Um, and then the depth would be 14, representing the fact that we have 14 days, right? If we take that n-dimensional array, we'd feed it to our convolutional layer, and then we would get some representation of how likely um, someone is to churn within the next 14 days. But we don't really understand this model part, right? So in between the kind of green part and the yellow part, we don't really understand that this model isn't very interpretable. So what we have is that we have, um, it's called a deconvolution arm, right? And the deconvolution arm, it goes from this really compressed kind of un un understandable data representation of who's likely to churn back to, <clears throat> a pixel-wise prediction of who's likely to turn, right? And so, yeah, so you don't really have to understand everything about this model. Um, you, you, there, there are lots of open source models that are able to do this. What's really important to understand is what the input represents. It doesn't have to be an image. It's an n-dimensional array. Describe anything you like. And the output um, is a height by width by one, image that associates every pixel to a class. And over here, our classes are zero and one, churn or not churn, right? And so if you guys uh, like this, so this is very high level, but if you want to see kind of a really well-defined um, fully convolutional neural network, um, please look at the paper unit. It's really old now, uh, it's super old, it's 2015, I think. That's when this paper came out. Um, but basically, you have an input image. It goes through a bunch of convolutional layers. And the convolutional layer basically will transform our input array into a segmentation map. Cool. So what does the segmentation map look like, right? So in our case, what would the segmentation map look like? Well, it would be a bunch of zeros and ones, right? So the segmentation map would maybe spit out probabilities. So at every pixel, it would spit out 0 0.3, 0 0.7, 0 0.2, and then we would have a decision rule, right? Based off maybe we did some analysis, we did some precision under the AUC curve, no, area under the rock curve, right? That's AUC. Area under the rock curve or area under the precision recall curve. Um, but we find some threshold that we're comfortable with and then we base a decision rule based off that threshold, right? And so what you're seeing over here is the moral equivalent of a segmentation map. It's the, if it's associated to class zero, make it red. Um, and in our case, zero is not churn and one would be churn. And what's important to note over here is that we've preserved the spatial structure, right? So we're still making the predictions on the spatial level but we were able to incorporate the temporal level by thinking of financial transactions as images. Cool. So that is how, that is one approach, right? One of many, many, many approaches um, for churn prediction on spatial temporal data. Let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of that. Well, a really good advantage is that it's really easy to get started. Um, so gone are the days where you have to like code up a unit or a deep lab yourself. You can just um, install it from the TensorFlow, PyTorch, Jax, Model Zoo. You don't have to 
implement those papers yourself. So it's a really easy way to get started, right? It's super, super easy to get started. Oh, wow, I got eight minutes left. Oh, I need to hurry. Um, it's also really good for dense data structures. Um, so if your data is super dense, there aren't a lot of zeros. It's really good. And convolutions work when local dependencies are key, right? So if, like, for example, to classify if something's a dog, you know, like the nose looks similar, to classify something as an eye, it's all local dependencies, right? You don't have to look at someone's feet to classify if it's a face or not. Um, it's all local. So that's where convolutions shine. Where they don't shine or where they suck is that if your data is sparse, so if you have a very sparse network, for example, um, um, in the previous example that I showed, sorry, my, I don't know if it's the network connection. Yeah, okay. I'm gonna go back because my going backwards seems to be more difficult than going forward. If all your merchants are located in one specific location, um, or if they're super far apart, you know, and they're not evenly spaced, you have very sparse data. And so convolutions might not be the right thing for you. Um, it's not a very sophisticated way of working with time. We basically just built a bunch of regressions, a bunch of weights on time. So it's not a very sophisticated way. And also where it shines is its weakness, right? Convolution shine when local dependencies are key. So if your local dependencies aren't key, you're going to have a bad time. Cool. So let's look at another approach, right? So we've looked at one approach of how we can use spatial temporal data to model merchant churn. There are other options, right? So this could this is a typical kind of graph of where something might go wrong, a time series of where something might go wrong, right? Maybe we're looking at a merchant, we're looking at um, on the x-axis is time, y-axis is sales, so this is sales through times, inherently spatial, I mean, temporal data. And we can see that something goes wrong between December 01, I mean, 2022 01 and 2022 05, right? So we wanna um, try act real fast over here, right? So what you could do is that you could have a time series model and what the time series model does is that it says, well, given that I know what previous um, data was and previous um, predictions. So for example, I have data on, um, on, on January 20 on what happened. I have data on what happened on January 2021. So I have a pretty good, oh, that's a bad example. Um, it's true. So I have really good data what happened on January, um, uh, on May 2020. I have really good data on what happened on May 2021. So I have a really good idea that like, you know, May 2022 should be somewhere around here, right? It should be way up there, but it's not. So we can use time series models to help predict emergent churn. And how would we do that? Well, we would take a moving average. So I'm led to believe that like this is used a lot in um, finance, it's like called momentum or something. Um, but MA stands for moving average, right? So we have a seven day moving average, right? Um, and that's gonna be highly variable. Lots of things can happen in seven days. We have a 30 day moving average, right? that's a lot smoother. You know, what happens, the averages, things average out over long time periods. And then we, do, we just divide that to just have a kind of normal, like normalizing factor by the highest um, transaction size within our weird window of, uh, of consideration. And then we can be like, if the value is less than some cutoff threshold, they churned, otherwise they didn't churn, right? So this is using temporal data um, to predict if someone has churned or not churned. Yeah, and so yeah, we we using this decision rule, we would be able to um you know kind of make an educated guess, right? So if you look at what's happening over the last seven days, that would be very recent. What's happening over the last thirty days, that would be yeah. So yeah, so the here's the intuition, if I understand correctly, the moving average over seven days would give me a very small value, so it'd be around fifty. Moving average over the last 30 days would give me something a lot higher because I'm incorporating information that's happened in the past. And so we expect a very negative value 
to that this person's likely return. And the negativity of the value comes from the numerator. The denominator is just a normalizing factor. Yeah. Yeah. Turn. Turn this bad. Cool. So um, how so that's that's using temporal data, right? So that's, that was just using the temporal nature of let's say transactions data to predict if someone's going to churn or not churn. Can we use the spatial data to help us understand if they're going to churn or not churn? Um, and so, yeah, so the hypothesis is, you know, maybe, I don't know, they're in a bad neighborhood or, you know, like the electricity or Wi-Fi there is super bad. So knowing how other merchants behave um, could be a valuable signal. I have two minutes um, for predicting whether or not um, um, our merchant is going to turn. So the idea is that we use something like K nearest neighbors, right? So we first need some representation of how close merchants are from each other, right? And this can be done via a distance matrix or like a Gaussian kernel, whatever you want. Um, yeah, but once we have that distance matrix, right? Once we are able to define distances between different merchants, so between that merchant and that merchant, this merchant and that merchant, we're able to perform K nearest neighbors, right? Because all that we're needing to do is to sort a list of distances, right? And if we know that, um, we know which merchants are gonna be near to us. And near doesn't have to be, again, Euclidean distance. It can be any metric that we want to define as distance, right? Once we have that, right? So once we have our K nearest neighbors, we can look at their transactions, right? We can be like, well, have they performed similarly towards the kind of merchant that we're looking at? And it might well be the case, right? So if we looked at their time series, it might be, they all might have a very similar dip at the same time. And this might mean that it's not their fault, right? It might mean that it's not that they don't like our service, is that there's an external issue that's affecting um, their ability to transact. Maybe really bad internet service or something, I don't know. Yeah. And so how would we modify our algorithm to now take, both, take into account both the temporal nature of the problem, which is the time series per merchant, and the spatial aspect of the problem, which is um, um, the new K, using the K nearest neighbors from our distance matrix. Well, for every store, we would calculate the same function as we did before, right? Uh, the momentum, the transaction momentum for merchants. And then what we do is that we calculate some aggregate metric, right? M is some aggregate metric and over here is just the average. So this would be the average prediction. Remember F of X, I was, well, F of X before was a prediction on a single merchant. Over here, F of X, I is the average prediction, predicted churn um, average over the K nearest merchants that we have. I'm in a really big meeting. Um, yeah. So, um, sorry, I think someone's at the door. Can you guys give me a second? Let's go. Some more open up. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And then all that we have over here is that we're going to check if our merchant is, yeah, we're going to check if the kind of decision function, so f of x i. Now, yeah, so we're kind of, playing fastball over here. So this XI over here for churn, for the decision for churn, that will be based on the merchant that we actually want to figure out if they're going to churn or not churn, right? This is this this F of XI for churn over here is the purple merchant, right? The average would be for everyone, right? So what we're trying to figure out is does the average for everyone, how does that compare to the single merchant for um, this purple block over here, right? And then so we just have a very similar decision rule. We have some coefficient for normalizations. So that's what the minus three is. It's just the normalizing factor to take into account the fact that we've taken an average and we have a very similar decision rule whether they've churned or not churned. What's cool about this now is that we've used both temporal data and spatial data. How do we use the temporal data? By the time series, right? We're able to calculate the time series for each merchant. 
and we're able to make predictions using Serima, Arima, um, LSTMs, um, um, or 1, 1D conflicts, or Serima, um, or just traditional machine learning, you know, random forests. So this is how the time came in and how we were able to use space is by having this distance matrix and being able to, um, you know, find the K nearest neighbors and yeah. Cool. So, yeah. So that being said, there are many, many different approaches we have to tackling spatial temporal data. So we've spoken about two. We've spoken about convolutional neural networks and um, time series with K nearest neighbors, but there's a whole ecosystem out there. There are traditional statistical methods. Um, there are physics models that model the evolution of systems through time. There are current neural networks, there are graph neural networks, there are bespoke graph neural networks because the whole job is to kind of um, model the kind of relationships between spatial temporal data. So yeah, there, there are many, many, many ways to skin the cat. And with that, uh, yeah, thank you for listening. Okay, uh, Pavaya, thank you very, very much for, for the presentation. And now we are open for questions. So feel free to ask any questions that you want to Pavaglio and the SouthPay team. Yes. Is it, is it my turn? Uh, yeah, yeah, go Pavaglio. Okay. Hey, hey Pavaglio, thanks, thanks for the your presentation. It was really cool. I have um, a question, which I'm not sure if it's something that you worked with before, but possibly. So you mentioned the, the CNN approach for, for using that dynamic data, like the sales per timestamp. But have you, have you done an approach where you used multi-model data? So combining static data and dynamic data, like static data could be, for instance, the socioeconomic level on that pixel or on that grid. If, if so, what do you typically use for that? I know you can concatenate the static data as a new feature, or you can do some more complex approaches. Thanks. Does anyone want to take that from the team? <laughs> I feel like the data scientists are way better answering this than I am. They're much more qualified. So uh, one of my answers would be like in certain especially in your medical use cases, you'll find, I don't know, like uh, certain MRIs, for example, and on top of the MRI, you'll also find static data, meaning um, like uh, blood tests or whatever you can find on top of that. So in that case, like you would kind of have two inputs to your model, like a first input, which would be the image and it would go through uh, a CNN layer and the other inputs, which will be the static layers, you just like put them through a dense layer and then you will concatenate any everything. And then you have the last layer where you have the classification layer. So in the end, like just think of uh, your neural networks as a pre-processing where like if you have different um, uh, modelizations, different structures, each one will need its own pre-processing. The, 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 um, the static ones would just need normal uh, dense layers, and the other ones would need uh, the convolutional one. Yeah, thanks. That makes sense. OK, thank you. So next question. Anyone? We bought a we bought a whole team of data experts here. So you guys are need to come Yeah, up I, I can so. think about something else. Just give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, this I have a question, but this this one is a bit more business oriented and a bit more out of the box. So you mentioned the the churn prediction. So churn itself is 
so predicting churn is not very actionable. Typically, you predict churn within a given time window. Have you guys done models where like you predict churn? So your target is churn in uh, several different time windows, and then you do uh, some sort of combination of all of them for the decision process. Like you predict if he's going to churn in three months, in six months, or in a year, and the marketing people make a decision based on that. I don't know if it's something that you've done before. Once again, this is definitely linked to the data science. <laughs> I think Gabby would answer this perfectly. Um, but I can just like give you an overview. So like currently we are looking at like one churn definition. Uh, so uh, trying to optimize a model just for that one part. And we're going to definitely look at like exposing uh, the knowledge that we learned from like the one part to actually expand uh, to like the different parts. Um, like churn for like open amount of times is like easier than shorter amounts. So like it becomes a really difficult problem when you like looking at shorter amounts of time. But the learnings that you get from like open days uh, mm -hmm. can like teach you where to go directionally in like the smaller time windows. So yeah, we like in a in a continuous learning process. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, I actually have have a. I did some some work on that topic, where we predict the the we predicted churn for three time windows, for instance, and we added some business constraints that the churn probability needed to to increase over time. But yeah, I get I get what you guys are saying. So there's a trade-off between actionability and complexity. That's actually an internal data test that we're trying to drive. <laughs> yeah. That it's like a good way to sign each check your model right if it says yes. probability of churn is the same today it was was when your model started it's mm -hmm. suspect say good Very okay good. thank <laughs> you so much paulo um do we have any more questions participants are you are you there Okay, so I guess our participants are a little bit shy right now, but I'm sure that this workshop was useful for them and it will help them for the for the for arriving to the solution to this challenge. Um, yes, so maybe I have a question. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so okay. much. <laughs> so I'm not an expert of vision. So I wanted to understand in segmentation process, so in convolutional neural networks, uh, do you need a supervised approach to segmentation or you can like do it uh, in an unsupervised uh, way like uh, as you do with autoencoders, but how do you do? Is it possible or not? So it is possible, but you probably have to be like a PhD at Google or, or Meta. So there's some really cool models out there. So the, the most recent paper that I read was called Barlow Twins. And basically the idea is that it tries to learn similarities between um, things that look very similar. That being said, even that isn't unsupervised, it's semi-supervised. So you need both labeled data and unlabeled data. The biggest business gains, like honestly, that come from using machine learning in business come from label data. Like, like unless you're doing something like clustering and you think really hard about what the clusters mean and you know you go afterwards and you meet with the stakeholders, what you tend to find is that um, you're the biggest bang for your buck for many machine learning problems, you, you, you really need to think hard about your data labeling strategy. Uh, of course. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Natasha, for the question. Um, do we have any more questions? No. OK, so if we don't have any more, more questions, I guess uh, this is it.
uh, it's the time for us to, to close, to finish this workshop. Um, I would like to say, uh, to thank again SaltPay and especially Pavallo for, for delivering this workshop, uh, which again, uh, I believe it will be really, really useful for the teams uh, to, to be able to improve their solutions for this challenge. I would also like to um, say a very big thank you to all the participants in this meeting, meeting especially the, the participants uh, from the teams, uh, because it will be, yeah, it, it, it's really good to have you here and to have these, these attendance. Um, and so, yeah, with this, uh, I'll say again, thank you. Uh, the, don't forget that this, um, the, the video, the recording of this uh, workshop will be uh, soon, will soon be available to you. Uh, so uh, the questions that you posed here and also the presentation from Pavalho will be available. And with that said, uh, goodbye and have a, a really nice afternoon. Bye, guys. Thank you.